Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our final lesson in our series to the ends of the earth, our study of the second half of Acts. This is lesson 12 and the final lesson, and we are in Acts 28 today. Uh, so last week we saw Paul with his friends, Luke and Aristarchus, enduring storm and shipwreck and finally making it to Rome. So what stood out for you or what have you been thinking about from those stories? One thing is how hard travel must have been for them. I mean, we just get on, well, normal years, we just get on a plane, <laughs> you know, yeah. but the, uh, just the tremendous area he covered on foot, you know, and in all kinds of peril. Yeah. yeah. And once, Go ahead. I was just going to say, and once again, they were saved from a storm. Mm -hmm. Another incident where you know, they were saved from a storm. Yeah. Because they told them if everybody stayed in the boat. You were saved from the snake too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So these these um elements of uh God at work, right? So such a such a difficulty of travel, um, so much hardship as has been the case all the way through Acts, right? There has been repeated hardship with this has not been an easy road. The witnesses for Jesus Christ have endured um, much suffering in the way of Jesus Christ, right? And the, their hardship continues. And through that hardship, we see the hand of God at work, bringing them through, bringing about his purposes. Yeah, great points. Anything else? Any other thoughts? You yeah, know, Mary. Another, another thing that stands out to me is how he stays with people a lot of times when he goes to these different places. And I think that's something our missionaries even now are used to doing. Mm. Um, in the notes I get from Joel and when he comes here, he's looking for housing or he's staying with people over in Europe. And it's something that we are not quite so used to doing here in the United States. Yeah, that hospitality and that the, the the sort of the unity of the brethren, right? We're going to see that in today's story, how he finds brothers, you know, and that it makes such a difference. Yeah, the the church, um, and and maybe this is because they are a minority group. They're a group that is beset by many difficulties, right? And so they have to support each other. And, you know, we're moving into a time where people are not just automatically Christian. And so that idea of hospitality being part of how we are Christians, how we support each other, how we support the message is really important. Great point. You know? uh, I don't think that I don't think the hardships sh slowed him down at all, regardless of how many problems he had. He was Paul was was always uh, ready and, and um, willing of, uh, to teach and preach or wherever he was, whatever circumstances it were. So much so. Right. Like he, every circumstance became to him an opportunity, didn't it? Mm hmm. It wasn't, it, you know, it was almost the opposite of it not slowing him down. Instead, every every time it was, he was like, there's an audience, that's someone I can, I can speak to. And it made the most of every opportunity, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great point. Yeah, struck by the, his confidence in his message. Constant confidence. Even when the ship's about to go down, he still has confidence in the message that he's, Trying yeah, to share. He's breaking the bread and sharing it. And they're having this moment of worship and the ship is about to break up, right? The, uh, mm -hmm. the faith and the unwavering um, yeah. continuity in everything that we see, right? Like how it all fits together, doesn't it? And I think that is, you know, y'all are getting into kind of these themes of Acts and how they, they add to the, the overall message of the Bible and apply to our lives, right? Yeah, absolutely. And did you have something? You're muted still. I might be able to un. There it is. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, good. 
Is it, is it, no? It, okay. Um, mm -hmm. I was just going to add on to what Mary said about uh, staying in people's homes. Uh, it reminded me of Jesus who said, you know, I, son of man doesn't have any place to lay his head, you know, and, and that was Paul. He didn't have a home. He was always on the go and uh, very Christ-like. In the footsteps of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that path took him to Jerusalem and then through these like repeated miscarriages of justice, right? We see this contrast between the justice of God and the justice of humans, right? So the failures of human justice, he um, appeals to Caesar, appeals to Rome. And um, over this time, he brings, uh, he, he takes this journey and we see that this is the work of God, like right between the vision that Paul has and God's um, assistance to them in surviving these hardships. We see that God has done this journey. It was, it was God's work. Um, and so now he has come to Rome. We're going to pick up in verse 11 today. You have a teeny bit of overlap from last week. So will someone please read verses 11 through 16? Um, and I hit the mute all, so be sure to mute, unmute yourself to read for us, please. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that has, had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Puteoli. There, we found some brothers who invited us to spend the week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Okay, thank you. All right, so they put in at this harbor, uh, they, they have another, this is probably another Alexandrian grain ship. Um, so it's still making the journey. It may have also been um, stopped from finishing the journey uh, by the same storm and ended up in the same harbor. We don't know. Um, but they, they go on this ship and they end up at Puteoli. This is um, modern name of this city is Pozzoli. Um, this is on the Bay of Naples. And at this time, this is the most important harbor in Italy. It was the main terminal for the Alexandrian grain ships and for travelers from both the East and the West um, and in route to Rome, right? And they spend the week here. Now from the Roman side of things, this is probably time for Julius, the centurion who has charge of Paul as prisoner to report in and then receive his orders from his superiors from Rome. And what happens with Paul there in Puteoli? They, they stayed, stayed there for with, a week. Yeah. And they stayed with brethren that were there. Yeah, there was brethren that there. It says we found brethren. So this wording of they didn't say, you know, we located the brethren, right? We found brethren. It indicates they didn't know that there would be believers there. Now they knew that there were believers in Rome because um why do you remember why? How do we know that that Paul knew there were believers in Rome? He has dear friends who came from Rome, from a church in Rome. I see some of you nodding. Go ahead and speak up. Remember Priscilla and Aquila? The, that couple that was so dear to Paul had been expelled when Claudius sent all the um, I think the Jews from Rome uh, out of, because of probably tensions between Romans, uh, between Jews and Christians over what he calls Crestus. He's probably um, mispronouncing Jesus Christ. Um, and so he, Paul knew there would be a church in Rome, but he doesn't know much about it. He doesn't know that there would be brethren uh, over in this harbor, right? So he finds brethren. Um, 
and they stay with him a week. You know, this is a great point that Mary um, made and y'all uh, commented on as well. The believers there are very eager for hosting Paul, right? And what would hosting Paul entail? Probably having a lot of other people at your house also as he teaches. Yeah, and he, and he has a party, right? There's at least Luke and Aristarchus. He's always guarded, right? So you're inviting Roman soldiers uh, into your life, which might be undesirable in some ways, yeah. And then um, they are caring for all his needs, right? He doesn't have any, um, he, he's a prisoner, right? He needs help. And so they have like by, by hosting him for a week, they're caring, all, caring for all of his needs in this time. And so it says, thus we came to Rome. This is like the conclusion of the travel narrative. Travel narrative has formed the last half of the book right? The first half um, has, you know, mostly the apostles, and then the last half we get mostly Paul's narrative, travel narratives, and so this wraps this up, and we see as he comes into Rome, what happens? What, who comes to meet him? Verse 15. More brethren. <laughs> Yeah, and these these would have been from Rome, and they come out. This would have been like three days' journey. The reason um, Luke mentions this is because they have made a great effort. They came like three days' journey out to this um, location to meet Paul and escort him in. Um, this is they you're be, they're behaving like you behave with a returning emperor. They're treating him like royalty. They come out and meet him and accompany him into the city. Okay, why would Luke include this? Why is this part of the story? Is it because he's a prisoner and being treated so royally? Right, there's such a reversal here, isn't there? Right, he, the, remember this is the you know the honor shame culture. His status as a prisoner brings this is a shameful thing. Um, when he later boasts about it, he's it's it's a it's a backwards boasting, right? In his letters, he says, "I'm doing everything backwards because I'm telling you my sufferings." This is the idea of the strength and weakness is has because of that element of Christianity that has become part of something that we identify with, but it's not how that culture worked at all, right? Strength is in strength. You boast in strength. You, you um, highlight not your weaknesses ever, but your strengths. And so Paul in chains under the control of the Roman um, guard they come out and they treat him like royalty. And it is a reversal. And it's a reversal in the footsteps of Jesus, right? Remember, Jesus, how, was, how did the same little thing happen with Jesus? And um, uh, uh, do an unmute there so I can hear you. My, my thing's not working very well, it looked, it looked like. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, what were you going to say? Um, it didn't. And let me pause. Let's get you fixed up. Are we supposed to hold down the space bar to unmute and keep it held down? You can. Um, you might try that if the button's not working right, right for you. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Can't there see you me. are. You're okay. here. <laughs> Okay, for a moment, I was just going to say when Jesus came in, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem is what I was reminded of. Yeah, the triumphal entry. And then how about um, during the whole trial series? Of Jesus, you mean? Of Jesus. I, it, I'm was not... all, it was unfair. It was very one-sided, much like there's really no accusation against Paul. Yeah, there, we there definitely no get truth. an echo. Yeah, there was no truth to the accusations against Jesus. And there, yeah. there was mocking that, you know, they were mocking him as a king. 
Yes, right. The cloud of thorns, the right. purple robe with the slaps. Like there's this idea of there's this ironic scene um, in the Gospels. Um, you know, you definitely see that irony really coming out very clearly in Mark, which um, we have studied together, where um, he's mocked as royalty, but we as the reader know that he really is royalty, right? And so Paul enters in shame as a prisoner, but, but the gospel is what drives um, him and what brings the brethren. So the gospel coming in the idea of witness and that escorting in as royalty is bringing the gospel into the heart of the roman empire in this way yeah so um verse 15 at the sight of these men paul thanked god and was encouraged this had to have been a high point for him right mm -hmm. um it's been such a hard journey you know, talked about the difficulty of travel and he doesn't actually know any of these people and he's coming in in shame and this, this welcome and this continuation of the, the reversal, the way of Jesus is such an encouragement to him. Yeah, other thoughts on this section? I was thinking with all of those people who came to meet him must have been an encouragement in that he felt he wasn't going to be starting from ground zero in sharing the message and he would have supporters who could, he wouldn't be able to leave because he was a prisoner, but he could share that message and know that it was going to go out throughout Rome. And that would have been a big encouragement to him. Yeah, and he will have to have people brought to him to be able to share the message and he will need complete support. Mm -hmm. He'll need food. He'll need, you know, all of these things. And, and as he says, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard them in this time um, under house arrest, it was possible that he was allowed to work um, and thereby support himself either partially or completely. Um, so it may be that he did some tent making in this period, um, or it may be that these believers have supported him completely during this time. Yeah. Let's read verses 17 through 30. And it came to pass that after am I, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, we neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spoke any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou think. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spoke the, the Holy Ghost of Isaiah, the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into, in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him.
Okay, thank you. All right, so let's look at his little initial meeting with the Jews in 17 um, through 22. Okay, what do you notice? What is Paul telling them? That he really had done nothing against the people or the customs, but you know, he had to appeal to Caesar. Right, we have this repeated, this has been a motif, right? This happened over and over, the theme of his innocence and yet the, the justice system keeping him um, condemned. He, he's not condemned, but you know, he's still under trial, right? That repetition of the pattern of Jesus. And, and also, you know, Luke wants us to know, like, this, this, or he wanted his original readers to know, like this message is not wrong. There's nothing wrong about it, right? Yeah, his innocence. What else? Well, he, he, on the, I guess, verse 20, he says, it's because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. So it's because of Jesus and my message about Jesus. Yeah, and notice the connection there, right? It isn't, it's, it's a hope that is the hope of Israel, right? How does Paul regard the, these, these Jews? How does he connect with them? As fellow Jews, as brethren. As brethren, right? He hasn't left Judaism. Mm -hmm. He says, my brothers, our ancestors. Go ahead. He appeals to things that they would know as Jews, to the, the hope of Israel, the, the, the promises that were given, the prophecies yes. for the kingdom yeah. and the Messiah. Right. He's still very much connected with them as Jews, as he is a Jew, right? And he wants them to know one more critical thing in verse 19. Not that what? That he, he has charge. a charge. <clears throat> right. So it, in this time, if he was wrongly accused, wrongly imprisoned, he could have been there to make a legal countercharge against the Jews in Roman courts, right? Mm -hmm. And he wants them to know he is not doing that. The mm -hmm. gospel does not mean going against the Jews. He makes no counterattack. When he writes the letter of Romans to the Romans, right? Um, he makes an argument that the, the Gentile believers can't turn around and despise the Jews because God chose to work through the Jews for bringing Jesus, right? This is the hope of Israel. Israel being these very people that he is speaking to. And they reply to him, oh, we haven't had any bad letters about you, but what do they, what do they say? They wanted to hear his views. Yeah, because why? Or because people everywhere are talking against this sect. Yeah, so there has been turmoil in Rome about this, and they don't know exactly what's going on with Paul, but they know there is something going on with this message of Jesus, and they would like to hear what it is. And of course, this is the perfect opportunity. They say to him, we want to hear all about it. And he says, yes, I want to tell you all about it. So let's look at verses 23 through 29. Um, what happens when it's time to come back for the full message? Who comes? A lot of people. Yeah, even larger numbers, it says. And they, you know, this is Paul's pattern, right? We get the same pattern that we've seen over and over. If he goes to the synagogue, although this time the synagogue comes to him, right? Because he's under house arrest. So they came to the place where he was staying. And how long does Paul talk? Morning till evening. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. What, what is he talking about all that time? It's a long sermon. It's all day. Did anybody fall out of a window this time? <laughs> all survived it. He talked about the kingdom of God and the law and the prophecies. 
Right. So the law and the prophets, right? This is a way of referring to the entire Hebrew scriptures, isn't it? So he's telling them the story of Jesus from what we would call the Old Testament, from the law and the prophets, the Hebrew scriptures. So he would have been telling the whole story of the plan of God, right? From creation and sin and through the covenant with Abraham and how that relates. And I will bless all people through you and how the Exodus makes a, you know, a baptism in the sea. He talks about this in his letters and how the Passover becomes the, um, the, the, the Lord's Supper, the meal of our Lord, right? And how he, God brings the people into his promised land, just as we have an inheritance with him in the future and how he brings up, he rises up David, brings David and, and says to David, you don't have to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house, that dynasty, that line of David, which he then points forward straight to Christ, right? The same scriptures that Peter used on Pentecost and that Paul has used in his sermons to say, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, right? So that it points straight to Jesus out of the house of David and the covenant of David and how the temple is built through Solomon. But now you are a temple of Jesus Christ. You are the place where heaven and earth meet and where the Holy Spirit does the work of God in reaching out to all people. He talks about the failures of the exile and coming back from the exile. And remember, the Jews don't feel like the exile has ended. Even though they came back, they're still oppressed. They're still not under their own authority. And so he would talk about how the end, the true end of the exile is Jesus and his coming and the freedom in Jesus Christ. And so all of that, it would be the whole story, right? This is Paul's message, always, always uh, that cohesive, right? That big picture of everything that God is doing and how it all culminates in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So of course he had a full day to talk about. He had the whole Old Testament to cover, right? And everything that the Psalms point to and it would have been a very rich message. And yet it was a message that was so surprising, right? It was surprising to Paul so that he could not grasp it until Jesus appeared to him on the road. Did he tell his story of his road to Damascus again? I would guess that he did, right? Because he was the one who said, I couldn't see it. Every time, you know, over and over he testified. Luke gives us three. He gives us three tellings of uh, Paul's story. He doesn't retell it here, but I think Paul retold it and said, I couldn't see it until I saw my Lord on the road. Yeah. On this. What do you think about, what do you think about his message to them? I'm always amazed at how God works these plans. Paul was very, very schooled in the old, in Jewish tradition. He probably knew it backward and forward and could answer any of their questions about that. And then he goes on to share the story of Jesus. I'm just amazed at how all of that, all those pieces work together and how much he used his background to tell about Jesus. Yeah, and even from a Greek perspective, remember your Paul, your great learning is driving you insane, right? He was considered very well learned even. Uh, yeah, so the Jewish scriptures, absolutely. And then his other learning, his travel, he spent years traveling, preaching, teaching, writing these letters. And so, yeah, that richness of his understanding will continue to come out as he's talking to that. Great point. What else? Yeah, I, I go back to our story of Esther. You were made for times like these. And that can apply to Paul too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It would have, I think that's one of Luke's big points, don't you think? is that this is God's doing. God has orchestrated this. This has happened through the work of not, not man, but God. How does Paul end? 
the all day sermon. Well, he tells them after he's kind of, I'm wondering how they took the, this, the passage from Isaiah, you know, uh, you know, never understanding and never hearing and uh, your heart's been become calloused, the, those, all of those kinds of words. And then he says, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. Yeah. I mean, all of that would have been pretty hard to hear. <laughs> Yeah. And I think, I think, um, you know, after he's, he's poured out the story all day, some believe, but to the ones who don't, he, we get this, this rebuke from the scriptures, right? And we remember that the prophets were rebukers, right? They are those who come, they are making the, um, uh, I've heard it described as a minority report, right? They're, they're giving the minority view of what, um, what God says to the people. So that remember the majority are saying, in the time of the prophets, the majority are saying, Lord, Lord. And then the minority come and say, no, your sacrifices don't matter. You're not understanding. And so Paul gives this rebuke from the prophets. Um, from Isaiah, straight from Isaiah, so much of, every, you know, he would have preached from Isaiah that day, right, because just like the, how the Ethiopian official was converted out of Isaiah, like the message is there of the servant and how the servant had to suffer, right, and so he says, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, right, and it's for the Jews, but and, the, and this, this is, um, Luke gives us his, this is his third pronouncement of turning to the Gentiles, right? We get these repetitions of these important elements, right, coming up, and this is one of them. So that this is the third time Paul gives this um, statement of, if you won't accept the message, God, God will turn um, my testimony toward the Gentiles, and he's bringing the Gentiles in. So, but it's also, you know, most of the world was not interested in this message, right? It wasn't just the Jews that weren't hearing and understanding, right? This was, um, this is, this is hard to hear. It's hard to understand. This is a statement of the narrow way. This is the upside down nature of the kingdom and this mystery that yes, the new age of the reign of Jesus Christ is breaking into the world while the old age is still going, while Rome is still in charge, while the injustices are still occurring, while we do not, as Hebrew said, while we do not yet see everything under his feet, all of this is happening at once. And so it is hard to hear. And Luke sort of finishes out his gospel message with this idea like, this is hard. This is hard to hear. There's a, there's a, a re repetition of suffering all the way through. And then there is this challenge of understanding. But the idea is that um, God has still sent his salvation. And he's sending it to those who will listen. And so even though we know it's it's a strange message. It's an upside down message. And sometimes it's stranger that we forget how strange it is and how upside down it is, but God has it for those who will listen. Yeah. So we come to Luke's, go ahead. Someone had a comment. I was just going to say, I keep looking at this and it's talking, it has been, it has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. That's what Paul says. And they will listen. Yeah. And for a long time, only a few, right? But um, in Paul's lifetime, certainly only a few. And the Gentiles, um, you know, were opposed um, to him as much as anybody, as much as the Jews, right? And yet um, some, some will hear, some will listen. Other comments on this? So we come to this final statement of Luke in verse, um, 30 and 31. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. We know he preached to them, right? He did. He never quit preaching. All of his message was the message of Jesus, right? Boldly 
and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and talked about the Lord Jesus Christ. So this verse, you know, it's <laughs> Paul used this time in house arrest. He just kept preaching. How did he preach? Holy. <laughs> with the confidence. Key word. Yeah. Yes, with confidence is one translation. This is that same key word that parousia that um the boldness that is characteristic of how people proclaim jesus when the holy spirit empowers them it's it's with boldness when the holy spirit and so we've seen that key word show up over and over in, in acts so they pray for boldness they speak with boldness when the when the <laughs> authorities saw their boldness you know this happens over and over and paul we, we the uh, the book ends with him preaching boldly <laughs> under the empowerment of the holy spirit what else? My, tra my translation. My translation says openly and unhindered. Unhindered. Okay, so openly is is what they're translating that that word that I'm I'm using boldness, but unhindered, right? No one hinder him, even though he's in under arrest. There's no limitation on the gospel. There's a limitation on Paul, but the gospel is not limited. So that even though he's in chains, the message is taught freely. What do we know about what happens next? <clears throat> I just always assumed that this is when he went to trial, but the notes in my Bible say that he might have been released here and maybe even have gone to Spain. Yes, Clement in the second century, I, you broke up, but I think I got the gist of it. Um, and I, I think it's uh, the connection from my side because I'm getting a little alert, but um, Clement in the second century talks about how Paul had a reprieve and ended up going, um, traveling to Spain. So he may have done that. He was um, in Rome for two years and then he may have traveled more after that and then back to Rome. And then what happens eventually? Is he crucified? He is executed. He wouldn't have been crucified. I um, mean, you know, we talk, uh, church tradition says Peter was crucified and um, not wanting to um, take on himself the same death of Jesus. He was crucified upside down. That's from church tradition. But Paul, as a citizen, um, when he was executed, would have been beheaded. So um, he was finally executed probably about AD 64. This um, his arrival in Rome would have been in early 60, um, like, you know, spring, probably they would have started sailing maybe this like the second week of February. Um, but, and so, you know, as they come to Rome, it's spring of the year 60. And then he's, uh, we get two years from, from Luke. And then he was probably executed around 64. What else happened with the Jewish people? Um, you know, 66 to 70. Anyone remember that one? Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Yes, thank you, Lula. So um, the Jews found, rose up against Rome. You know, this is, a, we, we've seen the evidence that this was a time of fierce Jewish nationalism and unrest um, due to that. And they finally rose up against Rome in AD 66. There was a, a, a period of war um, that didn't end until AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem, the complete um, sack of that city um, and destruction of that city. And so Luke wrote his story, um, you know, definitely after the two years, right? Because he tells us two years. And then, you know, given the research that he did, the time that would take, the writing of the gospel, the writing of Acts, this was not a fast process. As he's traveling around, he's interviewing witnesses. He probably writes after the fall of Jerusalem. Um, I'll just mention to you that scholars disagree on that. But um, I think the majority view is that it's probably after the fall of Jerusalem. And the only thing that keeps anyone from thinking so is like, well, then why did he end the story here? So why do you think he ended the story here? Well, one thing that came to my mind uh, when you asked that question uh, 
was that his purpose is not to make Paul the hero. The story is about Jesus, and he wants that to be the message and for it to not be diverted to more of Paul. You know, I don't know. That's just what came to my mind. Yeah, it's not a Paul biography, right? We're not telling the story of Paul from beginning to end. Great point. What else? To, to me, I thought that he just, he can still continued. And so the story was told with this. So there really wasn't any point to keep going over and retelling the same work Paul would continue to do, it leads us to, be, to believe Paul continued what he was still doing and, and the story was told. Yeah, we get quite a bit of repetition already, don't we? Yeah, so um, there's this idea that like, he has told the story as he wants to tell it, as he has, been, you know, we talked about this when we talked about what kind of material is Acts, right? It's history, but it's history to the purpose of theology, right? To a theological meaning, to the, to the conveyance of truth. And so he has, he has brought out the truths that he wanted to bring out by completing this. What, how, what has he brought out? What are the themes do you see? How do they matter? Well, spreading the, spreading the message to the ends of the earth, our title of our series, you know, um, and witnessing. Someone spoke up, but I, try again. Who? Who? Me? Or did you mean, were you speaking to me? <laughs> I'm not sure. My connection is unstable, and so I'm having a hard time. But um, whoever it was, uh, if you could go ahead, that'd be super. Okay. Well, I, what I just said was that um, it was about um, you know witnessing about Jesus. It was about going, spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth, and about the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, emboldening them and, and guiding them and um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit on all the themes of Acts that we talked about. Um, that's great. Um, we talked about Jesus, how Jesus is the key figure in Acts and, and that this is still, you know, this is still a, 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 a post gospel gospel, right? It's still the good news about Jesus, right? And we see the Holy Spirit and the important role that the Spirit plays. And even in this final statement, Paul says the Holy Spirit said, Right. So, and he speaks with boldness, the characteristic way that you speak um, as a, as a um, indwelled believer, as a believer um, under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that theme verse tells us it's going to be about the witnesses, right? You will be my witnesses going all the way back to 1-8 in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so the witnesses keep showing up. They keep doing the witnessing, right? When we, um, way back on the verse 23, um, where the Jews come to meet where he's staying and from morning till evening, he testified to them. NIV says he declared to them, but this is the word testify. It's the word used in a court for testimony. It's the word from which we get martyr. Um, and so he testifies to them the kingdom of God, right? They are witnesses. All of them, including Paul, are just in this line of witnesses, the apostles and the church. This is the new people of God. Aren't you just, aren't you just, or I am, I guess, amazed at Paul's persistence, uh, I guess because of his confidence. He always faces these non-believers, but it doesn't stop him because they're, you know, he goes on. Yeah, he, he keeps telling 
Uh -huh. what he has to tell, right? That's what a witness does. They have information, they have something they have witnessed and they keep telling it. Yeah, and we see the, the, uh, that idea of witness is such a strong theme in Acts. Mm -hmm. so. And he speaks to a variety of audiences with a variety of objections, and yet it's the same message. It doesn't change. Yeah, he Which, alters how he talks to them. Yeah, he speaks um, to the Jews, I became a Jew, to the Gentiles, as a Gentile. You know, that the, his way of speaking them is um, designed to meet them where they are, um, but always to witness to the truth of what he knows about God and Jesus. Yeah. And even and to, then our, go ahead. And say, even to, to death, you know, willing to die. <clears throat> yeah, he declared he was willing to die when he went to Jerusalem, and he was no less willing all the way through. Um, and we, you know, he was by far not the only martyr, not in Acts, and certainly not um, in the church. All of these um, witnesses would be witnesses in the in the sense of martyrdom, right? They, as they would go through, and they would still. This is one of the the factors that we think about when we think about. Um, you know, do we trust the message of the gospel? Do we trust these witness accounts? Would these witnesses have gone all the way to death saying something that they didn't believe was true, right? And we see mm -hmm. the strength of belief through all of these witnesses through the years and even continuing after this. So, you know, we get out of this, you know, you really see that's the last um, theme of the fulfillment of scripture, don't we? Right. So the plan of God has gone all the way through, right? Acts is, is a contained story, right? He tells the story. He does his, he wants three repetitions of this and three repetitions of that. He has his themes. He has his pieces that he brings together and begins it and ends it. And yet it's a story that reaches back and reaches forward, right? All the way back into the story of the people of God over the years, the covenants that God has promised, you know, Solomon, David, back to Abraham, those covenants, those promises that he has made, he's bringing to fulfillment. And so this story reaches back. And I think this is why we get, Luke gets such an emphasis on the Jews, right? Paul keeps going to the Jews. He shows it over and over and over. Even when he has trouble with them, he's back with them, asking them to believe in the message because these are the people that God has used to bring the kingdom into being, right? And so that never goes away. It's always an important element, always through back through scripture and then reaching forward, right? We are still in the time of the church. This is the time between the times. This is the time where Jesus is exalted and yet we don't see everything under his feet, right? And so we live in this time and the story ended, but it isn't over. The witness for Jesus continues. And as, as his people, you know, if we uh, submit to the Holy Spirit, we have that boldness. We have the ability to take the gospel. You know, Paul Luke ends the story with Paul taking the gospel into the seat of human power. The people who say, I run things. I'm the Prince of Peace. I'm the Savior. That's where Paul takes the gospel. And don't we have that opportunity? There are so many people who will say to us, I'm in charge. I know I, I, I run this place. And we keep bringing the gospel into those moments, into those lives, into those places. What else? What do y'all, what else do you think about? What is this sort of, this, the, the whole study meant to you? Where does it reach you? Paul is very determined to convert as many people as he can throughout his life. And the other thing when you, that it's going to go back a little bit to what you were talking about. It in my timeline that I went back to look at it said that he was released from prison in 62 and I know that could be give or take and but but then so he was released but they still killed him and I'm understanding perhaps it was the Jews that killed him so and there's another parallel to Christ 
uh, we think he was executed by the Romans. It, we, do, we really don't have the very end of life details. Um, like, you know, like we would if Luke had written it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which would have been on, under Nero. So you know, you you can you can think about what you know about Nero and his cruelty. Um, he Nero reigned until sixty eight, until his death in sixty eight, um, and so he was the um, emperor at the beginning of the Roman Jewish War that started in sixty six. And we think Paul was probably executed around sixty four. So, so even though they didn't find anything that he had done illegal, they still executed him because his teachings of. Or the inciting of riots or that, remember, you know, who, who gets arrested when, when Paul's being beat on Paul, right? Yeah, his determination is a great point. Yeah, and it, it just goes to show who's in charge at the time as to how they react to those incidents and whether they take into account the full charges and who actually did it, who actually caused all of that to happen. Yeah, and you know, Luke makes a, a, a very, um, like he's making a case for Christianity not being illegal, right? We see that ruling of Gallio and we see the, the, the whole like, Felix Festus Agrippa, a little sequence saying he's done nothing deserving of death. And so you get like through these narrative stories, you get the message, like there's nothing illegal about Christianity, but you know, he's, he's trying to make that point into a world where there were these waves of persecutions where Christians were executed um, by Rome, by, you know, they, they were, um, heavily persecuted to the point of death over these next um, decades and a couple of centuries. So, I mean, that's Paul, that's Luke's argument. Um, and, but it's truth doesn't necessarily convince everyone, right? Uh, the, this, this is just something sort of aside when you mentioned Spain a while ago, I, I, I remembered an incident. Uh, <clears throat> I, when they talk about the Jews being dispersed or having to flee, you know, because of persecutions or whatever, somehow or other, I just sort of figured, well, they, you know, they left Jerusalem and they went to Greece or maybe to Italy and kind of staying around the, the tail end of the Mediterranean, even down into Egypt. Uh, but then I was reading a book, this was a hundred years ago, and I don't even remember what the book was. Uh, and it wasn't even about Christianity or Jews or anything, but in that book, um, I have not forgotten this. The, whoever was exploring or whatever, they found a silver mine in Spain and they dated it to Roman times. And when you stop to think about it, of course, with Rome getting all the gold and you know riches and everything, and obviously they would go wherever it was. After all, they went all the way to England, right? Right, uh, right. But, uh, but what was interesting was uh, they opened this mine up uh, and took out debris and all this kind of stuff. But way back in there, carved into the wall was the statement, oh God, don't forget me in this place. And it was written in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So they figured the guy was a Jew, uh, maybe even a prisoner, uh, and then when you stop to think about it, that's a good place to put prisoners to work. work After all, place. you only have to guard the entrance. They can't get in or out, you know. Uh, in fact, you don't ever have to bring them out until they die. And chances are he died in that mine. But I thought that was fascinating that even um, under conditions like he probably was, he remembered, he said, oh, God, don't forget me in this place. 
-hmm. It reads like the Psalms, doesn't it? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. And through, you know, through the time of the diaspora, after, you know, after the exile, um, in, in even, you know, going, entering as Jesus is coming onto the scene into that time, we have a Jewish diaspora where there are Jews um, all over the known world, yeah. um, and with pockets of them. And so, yeah, I think in AD 70, they would have spread out to all of those places where they would have had connections, where they could um uh, receive some help, you know, um, it was, and it was a terrible time for Jews. Mm -hmm. Anything else? And I'll, then I'll wrap us up. I think, you know, that the, one of the things that has struck me so fully about the story of Acts, you know, definitely those those pieces of the story as they point backwards and they point forward, they, you know, into the whole history of the world, all the way back to creation and how that message was one message. And then forward to us, it is still one message. We still have the opportunity to wit be witnesses um, for Jesus Christ, for the, his lordship and his kingship and his reign. And though, even though it's hard to see, we have our opportunity to witness to it. And throughout, we see that all of that fits into the plan of God and the work of God in the world. So that, um, you know, the world isn't just, you know, turning on its wheel and every so often God reaches in and, you know, tweaks something. This whole thing is the plan of God from beginning to end, sustained by God, supported by God, a part of his, everything he's doing. And as we witness, we partner with him in everything that he is doing. And so everything that happens is part of, you know, the, the story as it's continuing um, towards that Jesus coming again. And, you know, in Thessalonians, Paul talks about how he enters like an emperor into the city. You know, it's the same image of royalty coming into the city. We meet him in the air and accompanying him, accompany him. And so the idea that it's all pointing towards um, the complete, the completion of the reign of Jesus Christ so that we then see everything put under his feet. And in the meantime, we are witnesses to that kingdom, even though sometimes it's hard to see. I've enjoyed this study with you all very much. Um, it has been uh, such a joy to see, to, to, to do the drama of Acts and to see um, the work of God in, in a new um, we are going to be studying uh, the divided kingdom in the spring. Okay, so let me explain that just a tiny bit and then we'll go to our prayer time. Um, over the years, um, some have been here and some haven't. And we, you know, we, we always try to make every study so that no one feels like they've missed anything. But over the years, we have done this whole Deuteronomic um, series, right? The whole narrative um, as it uh, of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Kings, uh, uh, First and Samuel, First and Kings, right? So that this, those are kind of a, a connected story that are, are written a little bit together. Um, and we we did a semester on Joshua and one on Judges, and we did the life of Samuel as you know prophet and priest and judge, final judge, um, and we we talked about David and his kingship, and then we did a series on Solomon in the temple, and so um, yeah. those were all really fun. And now we're up to <laughs> the after the after Solomon. What happens is that we get Israel divided into the northern ten kingdoms and the southern. Um, two kingdoms that um, that split that happens, and everything starts really, really going downhill. You know, in the in the um, in the Old Testament, <laughs> there's always the Bible never um, shies away from telling us there are problems. Like where there are people, there are problems. Um, the problems get even more pronounced in the divided kingdom in this time after Solomon that leads. Um, 
you know, going forward will eventually lead to exile. So as we have studied, we want to do, you know, that next. So we'll be starting right at the, the point of Solomon's death. Um, we'll look at his son, Rehoboam and uh, Jeroboam coming in, like all of that and going forward. And that will be our spring semester study. So it'll be some interesting drama again. Um, and we'll look for how it points us um, to the message of the gospel, because we know all the way through those Hebrew scriptures that they are somehow about Jesus. Deanna, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You've, Deanna. Really made, you've really made these uh, travels so much clearer to me and me brought out the themes of Acts so vividly. We really appreciate your yes. time and teaching. It, it's been really neat, hasn't it? Really um, such a, I don't know, so, so vivid and such a joy to discuss with you all. Yes. Janelle has our prayer today. Are there any new prayer concerns that uh, haven't been